I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Zalka Tinge Virag, a storyteller from Budapest, Hungary. For more, please visit her website, multicolorediary.blogspot.com. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. I've been following your Twitter forever, and it it brightens my day every day seeing all these stories. I just love it. Uh, Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I love Um, how the technology has kind of brought these, like, old-school... Uh, ways and traditions like back like having a platform again a new platform it is it's fascinating and it's very interesting to have such a large number of people participating in it it's you would think that it's a very niche topic to talk about folklore on social media but there are so many people sharing amazing you know work and and tidbits and family traditions and uh, it's good to see that there are so many people using twitter and using social media and uh, actively working with folklore (laughs) exactly i love like folklore thursdays it's like my favorite thing (laughs) yeah it is it's it's lovely there are actually three days now uh in a week that you can participate in you have uh, the hashtag for Folklore Thursday, you have the hashtag for Fairy Tale Tuesday, and you have the hashtag for Mythology Monday. So Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, there's a lot of uh, folklore and mythology activity on Twitter. <laughs> I love it. And there's all these different themes with like what they're going to post during the week, whether it's like animals or different sorts of kinds of tales. You're doing this endangered species series. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's for the A to Z challenge. It's a it's a blogging challenge that happens every April, and uh, you have to post one blog post with each letter of the alphabet. And um, and I came up with endangered species because um, I was reading up on pangolins, uh, <laughs> and and uh, I thought that it would it's it's such an interesting creature. There must be some stories about it. And uh, then I started researching, and I thought this would be a good theme you know, in this current uh, climate uh, situation to like raise awareness of all these strange creatures and all their strange stories and how amazing they are. So that's why I did the the endangered species folktale uh, theme this year for A to Z. What's a pangolin? Pangolin is a uh, a little creature that lives in Africa and like South Asia, and it's uh, it has scales. It has a very long tail, and it's uh, it's it climbs trees, and it, it's a uh, it's it's a mammal. It's a scaly little scaly mammal. Kind of looks like an armadillo, but with scales. Ooh, I'm gonna have to check <laughs> that out. It's gonna be featured uh, in A to Z when I get to the letter P. Uh, <laughs> so. And of course, I commented, I told you before, I love that you say in your in your bio that you're a recovering archaeologist. How did that transition <laughs> happen? You have to tell me the story. <laughs> well, uh, in Hungary, back when I was in, in high school, you um, and you went to, wanted to go to college, you had to pick your major ahead of time. So like you had to take the entrance exams uh, to a specific major in, uni- in the university 
And I picked archaeology because I love, you know, history and historical fiction and love old stories. And uh, I got accepted into the archaeology program at the university. At the time, we didn't have the uh, BAMA system in Hungary. So you did five years and you got a master's degree in, in archaeology. And, uh, and I really loved it and I enjoyed it. And I, I finished my degree, but I never actually worked as an archaeologist <laughs> because, um, because in, along the way, I discovered that you can be a professional storyteller. And I loved storytelling as a profession and as a calling a lot more than I loved archaeology. So I finished my degree, but I never got a job as an archaeologist. And I'm using... You know, I'm using my knowledge in archaeology for research. I'm using it for uh, historical reenactment. I'm using it for, um, you know, role-playing games. But I'm not actually working as an archaeologist. <laughs> yeah, but I love that. Um, and you tell stories to children. You do overnight things. You do all sorts of things with storytelling. Yeah, it's uh, it's all age groups, really. Um, as a professional storyteller, you get invited to completely different things, you know, libraries, schools, museums, uh, library sleepovers. That was a really fun one. Um, and uh, I love teenagers. Teenagers are an amazing audience and not many people do storytelling for them, uh, but they are really, really appreciative of, uh, of stories and, you know, folk tales and legends and big hero stories. And, uh, and I like to seek out uh, events where I get to tell stories to teenagers. So they are my, they are my favorite audience. <laughs> yeah. I love teenagers too. It's such a great age and there's so much going on where people are like individuating from their families and kind of finding their own way in the world. Exactly. Yeah. And you mentioned role-playing games, too. That's kind of a way that people can continue um, kind of playing and being more imaginative as they get older that's, like, societally okay, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. I was a role-player when I was a teenager, and it helped me, you know, make friends. It helped me try different roles, like literally roles that you can play in a community or, you know, um, types of things. Uh, that you wouldn't necessarily try in real life. Um, and uh, it, it helped me a lot to, you know, being a very nerdy teenager to, <laughs> to be more social and learn about myself. And uh, then when I went to America, I went to the U.S. to do a degree in storytelling. Oh, wow. I went to uh, East Tennessee State University. They have a storytelling master's program. And uh, I wrote my, my storytelling thesis on role-playing games as a form of storytelling, because essentially that's what it is. You sit around a table with a bunch of people and you make up a story together. And I, I wrote my thesis on how this can be used for, for high school education, like how you can, you can use it with teenagers to make them interested in, uh, you know, in mythology, in traditional stories, in things on the literature curriculum. And it was a really fun project, and I got to test uh, games that I designed with uh, high schoolers from a local high school. So uh, it's kind of the storytelling and the role playing kind of converged uh, in my academic work. That is so cool. How did you find this degree in storytelling? Um, when I found out that you can actually be a professional storyteller, I found that that's a job that people do. I started, I started researching it and I started emailing with uh, American storytellers back. This was like 15 years ago. And back then in Hungary, it wasn't really known that you can be a professional storyteller. And, uh, uh, I started started emailing back and forth with American tellers and tellers from different countries in Europe, and they were helping me figure out what it means to be a professional storyteller. And then I, I, I applied for a scholarship that uh, gave us a year in the U.S. because I wanted to go to American storytelling conferences and storytelling festivals and, you know, learn more about it. And I spent a year uh, in Connecticut in, at the Trinity College and uh, over, the, over the course of that year, I went to all the festivals and all the conferences that I could manage, uh, you know, from the student budget that I had. And I went to the National Storytelling Festival in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And when I was there, they told me that, you know, that in the neighboring city, in Johnson City, they have a university program uh, for a master's degree in storytelling. 
it's kind of tied to the National Storytelling Festival in a way that it attracts a lot of storytellers to the area every year. And uh, they teach classes at the university sometimes. Uh, so when I finished my degree in archaeology here in Hungary, I applied for a Fulbright and I got a Fulbright scholarship and uh, went back to Tennessee. And uh, the Fulbright committee was very surprised. They were like, honey, do you know where Tennessee is? Uh, <laughs> it's because most Fulbrighters go to either New York or, you know, the, the West Coast. And uh, and I wanted to go to Tennessee and I loved it. And I really, I'm really, really happy that I got to do that uh, storytelling program at ETSU. Um, and yeah, that's how I, that's how I found out that it existed. And it's a very small program, but it was very nice, kind of like a small storytelling family to, um, to do to a degree there. I love that. I love how there's so many different ways of being in the world than we're taught when we're young. I feel I feel like this the societal like mainstream views are so narrow and then as you get older you learn like there's all these completely different avenues you can take and I really wish that those avenues were made more available to people when they were younger. So people didn't feel like they had to funnel themselves through these like really stringent academic systems before they find what they like really want to do or their calling. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it was kind of very liberating when I went from the Hungarian University to the American, to Trinity College, because I did, we didn't know at the time that in America you can, you know, shop around before you declare your major. That was not a thing that Hungarians did. And I was like, oh, I can take history and I can take dance and I can take biology and then I can make up my mind later. And I thought that was, you know, amazing because... In Hungary, you start preparing for the entrance exams when you're like 16. And who the hell knows what they want to be when they are 16 years old? Nobody does. Like, that's very rare to to have a clear vision at that point. And it's a lot of pressure for students to like make up their minds two years before they go to college. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I guess I would think usually when someone has a really clear vision when they're really young, it's probably their parents' idea for them, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe yeah, like sometimes it's theirs, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in very rare cases, it's probably theirs. But it's it's very lucky to be that sure about what you want to do for the rest of your life. And, and with that... storytelling, you know, you get a lot of you know worry. I got a lot of worry from the family saying, you know, you can't make money from that. You can't make a living as a storyteller. And uh, and my parents were really supportive, and they they supported me, and they you know got me storytelling books, and they helped me build a website and. And my parents really supported me in whatever I wanted to do. But uh, it was kind of hard to explain to people that, yes, this is a profession and you can make money from it. And and I, I usually these days I usually say that I know at least two people who are professional mermaids. And if you can make a living from being a professional mermaid, you can sure as hell make a living from being a professional storyteller. <laughs> Absolutely. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> I think, too, it's so... Yeah, it's just such a necessary kind of, I don't know, it's art form, it's educational, it's historical, like you said, and it ties together so much in like one, like really enjoyable way. Like people learn so much from like fiction or mythology or storytelling that, that I feel like they take in so much better when it's in this engaging, fun way rather than this like really stringent kind of you have to memorize these ideas way. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really the they call it the Swiss Army knife of education. It's you can <laughs> you can connect storytelling to whatever subject you're teaching, and it sticks better. It's just you know people are wired to to appreciate stories, to understand stories a lot better than they just take in factual information. Exactly, it gives everything a content, and you can remember the characters and and learn the lessons that way. I love it. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a story? <laughs> I really like, uh, I, I started, when I started storytelling, honestly, I didn't start with Hungarian folktales, which is strange because I'm Hungarian and I grew up with Hungarian stories. But when I started telling, those were not the most interesting for me. And I started with um, mythology. Greek, Greek and Roman mythology. And I started with uh, Irish stories. I love, I love Irish legends and the folklore. But uh, in terms of mythology, I have this really fun um, 
story that I like, um, which is a um, Greek folktale. And, you know, when we, in Folklore Thursday, when we talk about tradition, we talk about storytelling, and we talk about mythology, sometimes it's hard to, you know, uh, make people understand that folklore is not something that happened in the past. And even mythology is not something that is, you know, a long time ago and doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I was at a storytelling conference in Greece and we were talking about Greek mythology and how a lot of Greek storytellers actually apparently don't tell Greek mythology because Greek audiences know it so well that it's not, you know, it's not something uh, that they would be interested in going to event and going to an event and hearing. So a lot of them tell Greek folk tales, um, modern, what they call modern Greek folk tales. So folk tales from, you know, the 19th and the 20th century that were collected from oral tradition. And there is this one story that I like, um, which uh, you will see why it's interesting, but it's a, it's a modern Greek folk tale. And it says that uh, one, day, one day, one time, a long time ago, God got angry at people. Nobody knows exactly why, but he thought that people were uh, mean, they were greedy, they were um, cruel to each other, and he decided to punish humanity. So God decided to take fire away from people. And one morning, people woke up all around the world, and their fires were gone. There were no campfires. There were there were there was no fire in the fireplace. There were no candles. There were no lamps. There were no torches. And no matter how they tried to kindle fires in every way that they knew how, fire didn't come back. They couldn't light their candles. They couldn't light their campfires. And they realized that without fire, they couldn't cook their food. They couldn't have light in the darkness. They couldn't warm themselves when it was cold outside. And they were starting to get very desperate. They were starting to get um, very sad and very upset. And, and they didn't know how they were going to survive that fire. So a couple of days went by and people were getting more and more desperate about losing the fire and trying everything that they could think of to get it back. Until one morning, an angel appeared and the angel, the angel descended to the crossroads and put down, um, put down a big carpet and placed his wares on the carpet like a merchant that's, that is selling something. And he was selling fire. He had all these candles, all these lanterns, all these flames put out um, on his carpet. And he said, fire for sale, fire for sale, come and buy some fire. And people started coming to the angel and looking at the lamps and the candles, and they decided that they should buy some fire. If they can't light it themselves, maybe they can buy it back from the angel. So somebody asked him, all right, how much is that lantern? And the angel said, well, that will cost you 10 years of your life. And they said, well, uh, all right, uh, how about the other one? Well, that will cost you one of your arms. Um, all right, how about that, that torch over there? Well, that will cost you your firstborn child. And whatever people asked, whichever lantern or candle or flame they asked about, the prices were just way too high and people were not willing to pay them. Even though it would have taken only one person to buy one candle or one lamp and then they could have rekindled everything else, but nobody was willing, willing to make the sacrifice and, and buy the first flame. So the angel packed up his things and went back to heaven in the evening. And the next morning he came again and he put out his wares and the flames and people came and they asked him, you know, how much does that cost? And the angel said, well, that one will cost you your eyes and that other one that will cost you your husband or your wife. And uh, it went on like that for days on end. And the angel showed up every morning and people showed up every morning and they hoped that the prices would go lower, but they didn't and nobody was willing to buy fire. Until one day, this old woman showed up and she asked people uh, why they looked so sad and why they were so upset. And they told her about the fire and the angel that appears every morning. And the old woman thought about it and she said, all right, I will, I will go and talk to the angel. So she wrapped a shawl around her shoulders and she hunched her shoulders and she leaned on a walking stick and she made herself look even older than she actually was. And she slowly walked out to the crossroads to the angel and she said, oh, you're, you're selling fire here. Um, how much is that one? And she poked her walking stick at the, one of the lanterns and the angel said, well, that will cost you your eyes. 
And the old lady said, oh, no, 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 no. My, my eyes are bad enough. I can't do without them. Uh, how about the other one? And she poked another lantern with her walking stick. And the angel said, well, that will, that will cost you um, your firstborn child. And the old lady said, well, I don't have any children, so that's not going to work. How about that other one? And she poked her walking stick at a torch. And the angel said, well, that will cost you one of your arms. And the old lady said, oh, no, 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 no. I need both of my arms. I'm very weak. I can barely get along as is. And so she went around poking at all of these flames and asking the prices. But all the prices were way too high for her. So eventually she said, well... All right, thank you. And she turned around and she walked back to the village and the angel packed up his things and, she, and he flew back to heaven. And the old lady went back to the village and went to the first house and she walked inside and she walked to the fireplace uh, where, to where there was a, a pile of kindling that nobody could light. And then she shook her walking stick and out of the walking stick fell all of these burning embers because the walking stick was hollow inside and she'd filled it with dry uh, mushrooms and the kindling. And as she was poking at all the flames at the angel's uh, carpet, the, the, the inside of the walking stick lit, uh, stick lit and it was filled with embers now. So she shook the embers out and lit the kindling in the fireplace. And suddenly people were coming to see that there was fire again. And they were bringing their lamps and bringing their candles and bringing their torches and relighting their fires all around the village and in the neighboring villages. And fire was spreading again in the world. So God looked down that night and he saw that there was light on the ground and there were lights uh, going around from village to village. And he turned to the angel and he said, well, who bought the fire? And the angel said, no one did. Nobody bought any fire. But apparently they have fire again. And they looked down and they saw all the light. And God said, well, somebody outwitted you. Somebody was smart enough to steal fire back from you. And you know what? If somebody was willing to do that and willing to share it with everybody else, then, well, maybe people learn a lesson from this. So let them keep the fire and uh, let's see if they learn from this. So that's the story of how the old woman brought fire back to the people. I love it. <laughs> and it's a, you know, it's a Prometheus myth. It's, it's the story of Prometheus with the hollow stick and the stealing fire from the gods, except it's, you know, it's a more Christian take on, on a very old story. And it, instead of Prometheus, we have this little old lady uh, who is very clever. So at the conference, we talked about how you know, if this was first, if the folktale was first, and then then Greek people at some point put Prometheus, uh, put the name of Prometheus to the story, or if it was Prometheus first, and then it survived in the oral tradition uh, as this little old lady uh, folktale. It's, it's a fascinating topic. <laughs> I love that. And I love how you're saying exactly how things like morph into other sorts of tales. I mean, that's clearly happened with kind of Christian tradition and pagan traditions all over the world where they've like taken over, uh, Christian took over a lot of pagan holidays in different areas and has found different forms like in South America and Europe and everywhere, really. Yeah, it is. And it's and it's Easter weekend, weekend isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is Easter weekend, yes. And that's, you know, with Hungarian traditions, Easter is, uh, is, is also very pagan. Uh, on Easter Monday, which is an official holiday here, Easter Monday, uh, the men sprinkle the women. That's, it's like, it's a spring tradition and they take a bucket of water and they like douse women and they, they say these little rhymes or these little poems about how they have to water the flowers so that we don't wither and, you know, we stay fresh. So it's, it's a fer it's a fertility, right? It's, you know, and then women give painted eggs in return for being sprinkled. So, you know, the, the, you, you don't get any more pagan than that. <laughs> Totally. And I'm, I'm originally from, from the States, from Miami, Florida. Um, mm -hmm. And now since I moved to Sweden, they're very pagan as well. Like they have on the, like right before the winter solstice, it's supposedly for Santa Lucia. Um, but it's like this ritual where all these women uh, and young girls walk down the street right in the center of town, which is where I live. And they're all dressed in these white robes and they literally have candle crowns around their head. Oh, yeah. And they're walking down with like <laughs> real fire on their on their head. And for the midsummer, they have a, a ritual with like the pole. They put a pole in the ground and their pole even has like this cross stick with these two like circular things hanging <laughs> off of it full of flowers. 
flowers and the women come and de- decorate it with flowers. So it's clearly fertility. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you couldn't, you, you couldn't really get rid of all of that just because people converted to Christianity. You know, these are very old, old traditions. Yeah, it's it's fun to see how they um, how they've changed and morphed all over the world and how different um, and with all the problems of kind of people traveling to other lands and conquering other lands. Um, also, there's this other side where these different kind of traditions came together that hadn't come together before. And it's created new things as well that that are interesting. Yeah. It is. And I love it that, you know, circling back to um, Folklore Thursday and all the social media folklore things is it's fascinating that you get to see if you follow these hashtags, you know, week after week, you get to see what the very popular things are. Like there are some images in folklore. There are some traditions that just remain very strongly popular, uh, even among the, the people of the Internet. You know, you can't you can't go wrong with black dog uh, legends. Like people love the black dog legends and there's always a lot of them on folklore Thursday on any given day. And, uh, you know, for mythology, you always have Hades and Persephone. They are like the stars of mythology internet and everybody loves them. Uh, it's really funny to watch how some of these stories just survive so well in a digital environment. Will you tell us more about the black dog? <laughs> it's, um, uh, Black dog is a uh, is a folk belief uh, type about it's uh, very popular in uh, in uh, Brit in Britain and uh, and uh, Ireland and uh, West Western Europe and uh, even in America, it's basically a type of it's type of stories where somebody encounters a large black dog at night on the road and then it turns out to be dangerous or it turns out to be protective. A lot of times they are protecting a place or protecting a person. There is a a version of the black dog that protects churches uh, or cemeteries. And it's just this very, you know, this is where uh, Sirius Black came from in Harry Potter. This is the, this is the belief that Sirius was based on, uh, the the dog form was based on. Um, Suddenly, sometimes they are called the Grimm. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's fascinating that there are thousands upon thousands of these black dog encounters, even in, you know, urban legends, in modern folklore, people claim to have met the black dog in various places around, you know, England or Ireland. Um, and and uh, I guess people like dogs and the people like the mystery of a large black hound and people like the fact that these encounters still happen today. It's part of urban folklore and uh, it's a very popular thing to talk about. A lot of people collect these black dog legends. That's so interesting. It's, there's something that must like strike a chord or like resonate with, with people. It does somehow, yes. <laughs> and what do you think? Why do you think Hades and Persephone are like the superstars? Oh God, I, I ran into this on Twitter. Twitter can be a double-edged sword because I, I actually was very fascinated by the fact that out of all the mythology that's out there, people fixated on Hades and Persephone. And I asked Twitter at one point, I was like, okay, somebody please explain to me what is so popular about Hades and Persephone because they there's like fan fiction about them and fan art and people see them as the ultimate romantic couple. And I was like, okay, somebody please explain, because this this story starts with Hades kidnapping his niece and dragging her to the underworld. Like, what what makes this the ultimate romance on the internet? And I got flooded. Like, I've never had a tweet that was so popular in terms of responses. And I just flooded, I got flooded with people, you know, talking about what they like about Hades and Persephone. And a lot of their their reasoning was, you know, centering on, oh, well, Hades never cheats on her. I guess the one Greek myth that you can find when somebody doesn't cheat on their wife. I was like, that is a very low bar to clear people. Like he does kidnap her, but at least he doesn't cheat on her. Like, you know, he does. There are some myths where he does actually, but that a lot of people don't know those. And, um, Apparently, it's a mix of like loyalty, of like marital loyalty, and a mix of 
the tropes that a lot of people really love in fan fiction, which is the dark, broody, angsty guy and the very peppy, like cheerful young girl. And it's a it's a romance trope that a lot of people love. It's the opposites attract thing. So they imagine Persephone as this innocent, like cheerful young spring goddess and then Hades, who is the lord of the underworld. And it's just it's a romance trope that people like. That's what I that's what I got from most of the responses. But it was really fascinating to ask people on social media how they see a, a specific myth and everybody had their own take on what this story should be. Yeah, because like you said, she gets kidnapped. She's like trapped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like she, she eats the pomegranate and then she can't go back uh, to the surface forever. She has to take turns being in the underworld and being, you know, being in our world. And that's how they explain the seasons. But somehow uh, people, you know, it's, it's the fan fiction thing. When they step over certain elements of the story to create the story that they want to tell or that they want to hear. And that's, that's how tradition works. Like uh, there is nothing wrong with taking elements of an older story and then making your own story from it. Something that is more fitting to how you see the world, more fitting to your values, you know, less rapey. Uh, and, <laughs> And it's, it's, you know, I love watching that happen. That means that, you know, oral tradition and, and, and lore still actively change and actively shape themselves to the, the, the values of modern society and, and, you know, shape themselves into the stories that, that contemporary people want to tell and want to hear. And I love that. That's, I think that's very important that any of these stories are not frozen in a specific moment in time. Yeah, exactly. They continue to live and evolve. Yeah. Even with, uh, of course, the coronavirus is happening now. And even with that, you know, there was this thing that went around the Internet that there's St. Corona in Italy and uh, she's the saint of plagues. And then people said this is not true. She's not the saint of plagues. But then, like, I have a lot of friends that are like uh, in Santeria and different kind of folk tradition practices. And uh, one friend, Jesse Hathaway Diaz, said, well, she is now because now people are praying to her in that way. And so now she's taken on this extra layer uh, of tradition that's going to stick, you know, and that, and that that's yeah. OK. It's going to keep evolving. And that's how these things grow. Exactly. Like a lot of saints have things uh, that didn't exist when they were sainted. Like, you know, there is a saint of television. There is a saint of uh, the Internet or whatever. You know, there are saints taking on new roles all the time. And, uh, and uh, those are things that didn't exist when they lived. But uh, now they are attached to it for some reason. And that's you know, that's tradition living, that's tradition evolving. Exactly. And I don't know, so you know, I'm a psychoanalyst, so of course I like Freud, and there's this Netflix show called Freud, and it reminded me of it because you were talking about fan fiction, and it's basically that. It's like really tangentially related to Freud, like it throws <laughs> him in there and like people he knew and the hysteric women he was treating or whatever, um, but it's really people just like, taking taking him on and like writing fanfic about him he's like working <laughs> with psychics and demonic possession and these like huge rituals and actually there's uh, some hungarian aristocrats in there that are having these like group rituals and trying to overthrow <laughs> austria hungary you know it's like it's amazing but kind of ridiculous but also really fun it's like for a while i'm like can they just do this can they just take any historical figure and do whatever they want with him and the answer is yeah i guess so like why not <laughs> yeah, as you know as long as you you know what you're working with and you know the the original stories are still available if you can read an actual biography of freud if you want to um you know you can read the actual roman and greek sources for mythology if you want to and then there is the there's the creativity that goes into it. I was, um, I, you know, I wrote my thesis on role-playing games and I wrote my, my doctoral dissertation on uh, uh, forum-based role-playing, digital, like role-playing games that happen in writing. And a huge part of that research was fan fiction. You know, a huge part of that was how people place themselves into the setting of their favorite movie or TV show or whatever, and they make up their own characters and make up their own stories. And I love watching that happen. It's just, it's fascinating to see people inhabiting these these imaginary worlds and making them their own and, and making them, you know, contemporary and, and fresh. And, uh, and I love that as a storyteller. 
Yeah, and I think it's really important for people to be able to be creative and have these spaces where they can imagine themselves in different ways because they feel like you grow a lot and learn a lot from that about yourself. Like you said, you can take on these different characters and with others interact in different ways and you can kind of try out things that you might be too afraid to try out uh, in real life, quote unquote, um, and see kind of how they fit and, and work with you. And then maybe you can somehow integrate that into like the way you are in the world and can help you grow in, in new ways. It is. It's, you know, I've been role playing on forums for more than 10 years now, and uh, I've seen a lot of people and I've been a part of a lot of stories and I still, I'm still very active in forum gaming. And you see a lot of, you know, people having, putting certain identities on their characters before they uh, come out as, uh, as, you know, having the identity themselves. You see a lot of people um, experimenting with gender, different genders in role playing, you know, uh, sexual identities. And then later on you, you have them, you know, coming out to the other players or coming out to their friends saying, oh, well, I played this character for a long time. And I realized that I loved playing this character so much because I also have this identity in real life. I'm actually, you know, non-binary or, um, or bisexual or whatever else uh, they've been playing. And it's a good safe space, especially online because it's anonymous uh, it's a safe space to play out certain things that, that you're experimenting with. And it's it's always really fascinating to talk to people when they get so happy. It's like, oh, now I understand why I play all these characters. And, and um, you know, you're happy for them because they had this space to where they felt safe enough to try out these things. Yeah, that's a really great point. It's a safe place to kind of try those things on uh, before you have to confront out uh, external reality quote unquote with it and, and with yourself and I feel like that's something you know when we're children it's okay to play that's how we learn and for some reason society's decided that we're not supposed to do that so much as we get older and it's such a shame because it's just people people like to act people like to perform we learn that way like you said we learn through stories and trying on characters and yeah it shouldn't be taken away it should be facilitated more and more for adults too yeah exactly and and uh it's i don't know i just i wrote my whole, whole dissertation on the role-playing games and i published the published the dissertation as a book later on and it's just there, there were so many topics that kind of channeled into that you know learning about consent uh you know in role-playing where where there are adult themes and there is sexuality and then you have to learn how to consent to your character doing something Thing. And I actually did some research on how this translates into, you know, players learning. There's a lot of teenagers playing these games. So like players learning to give consent and to like have their boundaries and establish their boundaries uh, because you can't do anything to another person's character without permission. And that also goes whenever those characters are having intimate relationships. So it's a, there are just so many things that kind of show up in these games that are very important in real life as well. That's great. I really like that. I'm, I'm a little bit, I, I had my first computer when I was in college. So when I was in high school, mm -hmm. I was still like typing on a word processor. And uh, <laughs> so when I did like D and D in high school, it was like sitting around a table with a bunch of people who dressed up in costumes in a comic book shop, you know? <laughs> so I've never done it online uh, with this extra layer of like anonymity, but that's really, really interesting. It is. It's. It's. Uh, I play a lot of tabletop D and D still. I have my group of friends, and I love. I love tabletop gaming. I never got into video games. That's. We didn't have that kind of computer at home that would like carry an actual video game, and we didn't have a gaming system. But I. I, play a lot, I still play a lot of tabletop, and I love forum gaming. You know, I write. I'm a writer, so like typing out stories is entertaining to me, and. I love it that it's asynchronous, so you can, you don't have to be at the computer at a certain time and you don't spend six hours playing in one go, but I get up in the morning, I get my morning tea, I check my posts, you know, I reply to the stories that are ongoing, and uh, it's a nice hobby, it's a nice pastime to have um, if you enjoy writing. Yeah, that's great. And then, you, like you said, they can end up becoming books. <laughs> um. 
I also love fiction and how and the storytelling of fiction and how powerful it can be. Like I feel like so much of what we're living in now has been written about in fiction books <laughs> in the past. And it's like yeah. a way that people can kind of write more what they really think uh, and put it in this story form rather and not feel like they're going to get so judged for it. Yeah, it's it's interesting to you know I'm in contact with a lot of people who write. Uh, I don't I don't really write fiction. I wrote historical fiction when I was in college, but uh, now I mostly write uh, folktale collections and like folklore themed. Um, I guess it's weird. It's classified as nonfiction. Like folklore collections are classified as nonfiction, which is strange to me. But uh, yeah, so I, I I do folktale collections in English and in Hungarian. Uh, but I love watching people who are, you know, creative writers and fiction writers. And I love watching their process and interacting with them online. And I have a lot of friends who write. So I love getting glimpses into how a completely new story is born. And uh, it's really, it's fascinating. What do you think about that, that folklore is classified as nonfiction? That's really interesting. That actually makes me <laughs> proud of mainstream society that they have classified it as nonfiction in a way. I guess they take it as academic publications. Like they don't put academic books in with the fiction books uh, in bookstores, at least. But it's re- it was really strange for me in Hungary when you go to, we have a lot of used bookstores in Budapest. You have a lot of secondhand bookstores. And you go into the secondhand bookstore and there is always a shelf that says folklore. Uh, or ethnography. So we have a separate section in all of the bookstores that have these kind of books of tradition and uh, folk music and whatever, folk things and ethnography. And I travel a lot. And I, sometimes in other countries, I go into used bookstores or like regular bookstores and I ask them where the folklore section is and they look at me like I'm crazy. Like I could not... <laughs> I could not find any folklore sections in London when I was like going from bookshop to bookshop. And I found one bookshop that had a mythology shelf uh, that had things like, you know, the Odyssey and Beowulf and and the classics. But I, I got so spoiled in Hungary with all of these like big folklore sections in bookstores that it's really strange that other countries don't classify their books that way. And you have to hunt around for the different folklore publications. <laughs> No, it's a really good point, and it should be. It's kind of in between. It should be in its own kind of section. The only places I found that I remember really having great folklore sections was, like, Ireland, like you mentioned, and Wales. When I was in Wales, they had a lot of, like, Welsh folklore. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it has something to do with, uh, you know, history and cultural history. And because in Hungary... Um, in the 1800s when, you know, after the Grimm's where this whole like national folklore collection started, Hungary had a lot of folklore collectors very early on and it became a very serious occupation to collect folk tales and folklore. So we're very lucky historically that we have so many collections. I'm doing this, uh, this uh, challenge, this reading challenge where I, I want to read a folktale collection from every country around the world. Ooh. And I'm up to 170 countries now. I'm almost I'm almost all the way around the world now. And some countries where it was extremely hard to find a folktale collection. It's sometimes it wasn't differentiated from short stories. Sometimes you just it was not in the language that I can read. I read English and uh, and Spanish and German a little bit, but like some countries you just couldn't find uh, collections in the language that I that was available to me and. Uh, there was a huge difference between how easy it was to find a folklore book from any given country based on their, you know, history with this, uh, with this type of research. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, do you have a list of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's up on my blog, uh, every country. I blog about every country when I finish the book. I like I blog about my favorite stories in the book. I blog about the connections that I found. It's like, oh, they also had a Snow White story. Um, so it's, it's up on my blog. It's called following folktales around the world. Oh, that's Uh, amazing. So now you've given me a new thing to do. I'm going to start reading (laughs) these different collections and then reading your blog about them. I love it. It is really fun. (laughs) And what a great way to learn about all these different cultures, you know? It is. I love learning about other places through their stories. Every time I travel anywhere, I try to find books about the local stories and and kind of learn learn about the cultures that I'm going to be surrounded by uh, through the stories that they tell. 
I love that. And you're doing, are you doing like storytelling online? I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Ever since the, you know, the lockdown started, I, I don't have any performances anymore. I don't have, um, don't have gigs. All of them got canceled, but I kind of miss storytelling and I miss talking to people. So I started doing Facebook live storytelling and uh, I also work. My main job is I work for an NGO that supports children in the foster system. And uh, my part of this NGO is that I train volunteer storytellers who go into uh, group homes and tell bedtime stories because uh, the adults working at the group homes don't usually have the time or the energy to do storytelling with the children. So we train our volunteers to go into these homes and and tell bedtime stories. And ever since the, the homes have been on lockdown and we can't go and visit them, I've been making storytelling videos that we can send in so that they can still listen to some stories, even though we can't uh, be there in person. And I'm doing Facebook Live to promote the the foundation and to get people to donate, to help us uh, stay in touch and, and keep supporting the children. We send in food for the homes, you know, we send in games for them uh, so that they are not bored. We send in, you know, technology, we send on laptops and tablets that they can use for digital learning. And uh, in order to, you know, raise attention, raise awareness and get some attention, I'm doing live storytelling uh, through the foundation's Facebook page so that people can learn about what storytelling is and what it is that we do uh, for the kids in the foster system. That's so wonderful. Is it any specific time and day that it's happening or? Yes, it's a, but it's in Hungarian. Uh, That's I okay. Have. I still want to connect people to it. It um, happens Mondays and Thursdays at 5 p.m. Hungarian time. And uh, I do, I plan on doing English lives as well on Sundays. Uh, not this Sunday because it's Easter weekend. So I plan on doing um, English language storytelling on Sundays starting next week um, so that I can tell some Hungarian stories to English speaking people. And uh, just connect with uh, all of my friends who are um, outside of Hungary. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Is there anything else you're working on or anything else you want to talk about that we didn't get to? <laughs> um, well, I'm working on, um, I'm doing, I have another series on my blog. It's called Feminist Folk Tales. Uh, which is basically every week I blog about a story that has some kind of a feminist value in it. Um, I had a previous series that was called Feminist Hungarian Folktales, and that became a book uh, in Hungarian. It's a collection of uh, Hungarian folktales that have these modern values in them. And uh, now I'm doing the international version of that collection. So I'm doing an international feminist folktales uh, book in, in Hungarian. There are a lot of books like that in English, but not in Hungarian yet. And uh, I've been blogging about this process and blogging about the stories and talking about what makes them feminist stories in my mind or what are the values that I find interesting in them. So that's another blog series that is ongoing right now is the Feminist Folk Tales. Every, every Folklore Thursday, actually, I, I uh, uh, timed it for Folklore Thursdays for the blog so I can share them. Nice. Yeah, I've seen some of those on Twitter. They're so interesting. <laughs> it is. It's a really fun project. And a lot of people think that it. I mean, when I say feminist folktales, I mean that I rewrite them to be feminist. Uh, you know, like Cinderella saves herself or whatever. But these are actual stories. I don't rewrite them as much as I just research a lot of traditional stories to show that these things did exist in older traditions as well. And all, you know, fairy tales are not all, oh, you have to save the princess. And there are many, many old folk tales and fairy tales where the princess saves herself. So, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes fairy tales can be pretty intense and dark and really serious. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's a lot going on in them. They're not like uh, washed out for little kids. They're not like made made nice you know they're deep yeah <laughs> that's that yes and that's important that is very important to, to remember and i don't as a storyteller i only censor stories for really really small children that still get you know nightmares from scary things but um uh, 
but a lot of folk tales provide this kind of buffer against harsh things in life that they only imagine as much as they can handle. And if you say, you know, they cut off the dragon's head, some kids just imagine the head popping off like a Lego figure and not necessarily with all the blood and the gore that an adult would imagine. And it provides them a safe space in their head to deal with things like fear or worry or anxiety. And uh, that's why as, as a storyteller with traditional stories, um, you know, literary stories are different, but traditional stories generally have that kind of structure that make it safe uh, to think about uh, dark things or difficult things. Exactly. Like you're saying, it's a safe space to be able to kind of work through those emotions and bring them up rather than kind of living in a bubble and then all of a sudden being confronted with something from the external world that might really overwhelm someone if they haven't been able to kind of express and work through those emotions before. Yeah. And I have kids, you know, like kids always want scary stories. They have a, a curiosity for, oh, tell us something really scary. And they experiment with how far they can go into, you know, scary stuff. And uh, and I also have kids ask me to tell them stories about death. You know, they, they want to hear and there are all these folk tales about, you know, tricking death or or going to the underworld and then coming back. And uh, kids ask for those stories. They want to have this like safe space to talk about those things. Yeah, and it's exciting. <laughs> it is. It is. And it's much better than actually just like sitting down and talking about these things, you know, as is. Without right. The, they learn a lot more, story. too, and you can go a lot further with it. You can say a lot more than you'd probably be able to say if you were just trying to communicate it directly. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It gives you a language. Stories give you a language to use for these things. A very symbolic language. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with storyteller Dr. Zalka Chenge Virag from Budapest, Hungary. For more, please visit her website, multicolorddiary.blogspot.com. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Now also available on iBook and Kindle. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast website, renderingunconscious.org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. And now, and dreams, let's see them. From the album, The Chapel is Empty, a collaboration between myself and Acoustic Timber Frequency, available from Highbrow Lowlife and Trapart Editions. You can find the CD and Deluxe Edition Limited CD at trapart.net. dreams. Let's see them. There were many small roads going higher up. His left hand, as if deciding how to answer. His question, 
even though it was clear that everything about this was a surprise. Walked for hours and hours, usually up to a little cabin high up where some yogis took students for short-term retreats. The sun seemingly always shone. The forests were lush and dense. The air was so filled with oxygen. The ministers only sun. Metabolic system had, on a holiday from school, arrived. Illusion would only be deemed to victory. Question allows him or herself. I'm alone. It's no trick. It's just that I have awfully new foundations. Looking out at the valley beneath them, they were all struck by the beauty. Beneath them, they could see the neat little village. Above them, the range just continued. Strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. I am overexcited and weary. And I need rest. 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 Happily, Von Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forgo my sleep. Tonight, I could not well do without it. Disgruntled new arrivals claiming took walks together from the come drifted into a little nap. This was A from B. Apparently, something was brewing. She was happy about it. If anything, he needed to be grounded. Brought back to Earth in a way. That was the least way to wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could allow some semi-wild dogs to join them as they sat down to their picnic. He patted them, although he knew they were probably flea-infested. And the wolf. There was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all around seemed to spin around. I kept my hello. 
with you. It's beautiful. The very same crystal clear transmission. Yesterday evening, he shook his human onlookers. A big ship hovering. How could you miss that?